But for tonight, tonight's is history happy hour uh, features Al Jones. Uh, Al Jones has a BA in history education from Lynchburg College and has served as the director of Appomattox County Youth Services and as a high school history teacher. He founded and was pastor of the Jesus Center Church where he continues to be a consulting pastor. And uh, in 2015, he founded the Appomattox Black Civil War Legacy Virtual Museum to tell the stories of Appomattox's African-American population. And Al Jones currently serves as the Student Family Support Specialist for the Appomattox County Public Schools. So he's a busy man, and uh, it's an honor to have Al with us tonight. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and uh, turn the screen over to you. Thank you so much. Um, what a pleasure it is to um, be with you. Thank you for the uh, invite. I'm very excited about um, history. And I love to find stories that are uh, untold or undertold. And I have an amazing story to share with you tonight. I want to talk about 832 Appomattox men in black. These were former slaves who were able to get an opportunity after emancipation to participate in their first election. And to come to find out these men played a vital role in Virginia's readmission into the union they also played a vital role in producing one Booker T. Washington. First, I want to talk a little bit about the social and political atmosphere in Appomattox in 1865 through 1870. First of all, you know uh, about the Freeman's Bureau, and there was a Freeman's Bureau set up in Appomattox initially at the end of the Civil War, April 9th, 1865, um, there was actually an office here before um, everything was transferred to Lynchburg. So the Freedmen's Bureau played a vital role um, here in Appomattox in terms of uh, providing food, providing uh, protection, um, and meeting the needs um, of the freedmen. Um, one of the most important things that um, these 832 Appomattox men in Black and their families were very privileged to have is the Appomattox Freedmen School. The Appomattox Freedmen School um, was a school which was started by Charles W. McMahon. If anybody's story should be told, Charles W. McMahon was a very naive 23-year-old um, white boy, you might as well say, who's coming down from Plymouth Rock, Massachusetts, and he is going to really change the world. Well, he almost got lynched here in Appomattox, but um, some of the leading citizens of Appomattox came to his rescue. Uh, Charles W. McMahon stayed here, and he became such a champion for the freedmen. Um, I say it all the time, if uh, African-Americans have known their history, um, I think the first high school in Appomattox would have been the Charles W. McMahon High School. This is how vital this man was to Appomattox and to the freedmen here. Well, he starts a school, and his school is located right in the village. Um, it was not located uh, somewhere out in the away from the village, but right there, almost directly, um, almost directly in front of the McLean house. And he had the audacity to name his two schools. His day school was called U.S. Grant and his night school in the same little cabin was called the Lincoln Night School. And no doubt in my mind that also he would have had his Union League meetings there. And the Union League was an organization out of Philadelphia, which uh, came into the South to try to prepare the former slaves for um, the ballot, to prepare them to be able to vote. 
But Charles McMahon became a champion in the registration of freedmen to vote in the education of their children. And um, he has a story that's amazing and, and we have to save that story for another time. So looking at the atmosphere in Appomattox, on March the 2nd, 1867, the first Reconstruction Act, Congress required, required black men to be allowed to vote. Now this is very interesting, and this is probably the case throughout the entire South. There were powerful white men in Appomattox who were fine with educating the former slaves, but for most white people, requiring black men or allowing them to vote was a bridge too far. So all chaos broke out when this construction act allowed black men be, to be able um, to vote. And um, that was March the 2nd, 1867. And then in March the 10th, 1867, we see the response right here in Appomattox, okay? A matter of days after the Reconstruction Act was passed by Congress, the Ku Klux Klan, you heard me right, the Ku Klux Klan is very active in Appomattox. During this time, they weren't called the Ku Klux Klan here and in Central Virginia, but they were called the White Caps. And I found that very interesting, the White Caps. But that's what they were called in Appomattox and in Central Virginia. But anyway, the Ku Klux Klan responded by attempting to burn down the Freedmen School. What a stark contrast. So you have the surrender with Lee and Grant in the village and almost opposite the village on March the 10th, 1867, you have the Klan attempting to burn down the small little cabin, the rundown cabin, matter of fact, that that school was, they tried to destroy. Miraculously, the cabin survived, but it was heavily damaged. So that's the kind of atmosphere you're talking about. Um, another thing that happened here in Appomattox as it did throughout the South was Blacks were afraid to vote, not only because of the Klan, but also there was a threat there of being um, put out. In other words, most of your um, former slaves are living on former plantations. They don't own property. So Charles McMahon, on July the 26th, 1867, reports to the Bureau that the freedmen are being threatened not to vote in the Virginia Constitution Convention election to be held on October the 22nd, um, 1867. So this is the atmosphere that is, um, that's the big challenge of the former slaves. You have the threat of violence from the KKK, and then you also have the threat of being put out. You know, you know, if you vote for the radical Republican ticket, you're out of here. So this is what these former um, uh, slaves had to contend with. Um, one of the things that I think is very amazing with all the intimidation going on, there were 839 former Appomattox slaves helped elect a black man. And that black man was none other than James Wesley Douglas Bland. James Wesley Douglas Bland, um, he was a representative for Appomattox in Prince Edward County in the Constitutional Convention held December the 3rd, 1867 through April, 1868. Bland is very interesting, fascinating in his own right. He grew up in Prince Edward County. His father was a man by the name of Hercules who bought his mother, so his children would not be um, enslaved, um, as it were. Um, they would not be sold off. And he was a carpenter. Um, he had gained some education um, by 1867. And um, he was the representative from um, the Reconstruction Party uh, running for um, office 
to represent Appomattox and Prince Edward County. Um, it's fascinating to me that Bland, um, you know, he escaped um, a assassination attempt in Charlotte County. Um, and some of you may have heard the story, Joe Holmes, Joseph Holmes, they just dedicated a, a historical plaque in the old courthouse where he was assassinated. And um, in, the, in, the, in the hearing held by the Freedmen's Bureau, um, not only was Joseph Holmes a candidate for assassination, but also James W. D. Bland. Bland is fascinating because you would think because he was part of the Reconstruction uh, or the Radical Republicans that he would be in favor of former Confederate officials not being able to vote, but that wasn't the case. When he got to Richmond, um, there were a lot of Blacks and whites that were very upset with Bland because Bland said that even former Confederates ought to have the opportunity to be able to vote. So he was really a voice for um, reconciliation, for peace, let's get a fresh start. Um, amazing, amazing uh, man. Um, December the 15th, 1869, while I was researching uh, Bland, I found articles in the uh, Richmond Times Dispatch, which gives evidence that he argues before Congress in favor of Virginia's readmission to the Union. Now, I know some people might say this is kind of like a long drawn out trying to make a connection here, but these 839 former Appomattox slaves, they gave him his political start. Yes, right, Bland got his political start by these 839 former Appomattox slaves that helped him get elected. And he goes on to represent uh, Virginia in the Senate and is sent to Washington, D.C. to argue that Virginia should be um, readmitted into the Union. And again, the, the radical Republican position was that Virginia had not been reconstructed at all, and they should not be allowed to um, have readmission to the Union. But Bland eloquently argued for Virginia to be allowed to be readmitted to the Union. So in a way, um, these 839 former Appomattox slaves, they helped Bland be a Black man from Prince Edward County, representing Appomattox at one time in Prince Edward, to actually go to Congress and argue for readmission of um, Virginia to the Union. And then another important fact, um, April 7th, 1870, Bland sponsored one major bill, and that one major bill enabled Hampton Normal Agricultural Institute to receive federal land grant funding. So he's responsible for um, Hampton Normal School, now Hampton University, being able to su survive in its infancy. Um, so again, I feel like those 830 former Appomattox slaves helped put James Bland in a position so he could assure that there would be funding for Hampton Institute. All right, finally, and this is a sad story, on Wednesday, April the 27th, 1870, James Bland is killed in the Capitol disaster in Richmond, Virginia. It seemed to be such a sad ending to such a promising career. He had rose from representing Prince Edward County and Appomattox in the Constitutional Convention of 1867. He had then went on to be elected in Prince Edward and Halifax to the Virginia Senate. 
and he was um, responsible for going against the radical Republicans, which he was a part of, and argues before Congress that Virginia should be readmitted to the Union. And he also was key in the funding of uh, Hampton Institute, and he loses his life on April 27th. And remember, Bland sponsored that bill that Hampton would become funded, a land, federal land grant funded institution on April the 7th. And 20 days later, Bland is dead. But the good news is, I feel that because of Bland's legislature, Hampton Institute survived and maybe it would have survived without that funding. But in 1872, two years later, Booker T. Washington enrolls at Hampton Institute. I think there's a great connection. And I believe that these 839 former Appomattox slaves who faced intimidation, violence, um, not having a roof over their head, they showed up to assure that James W.D. Bland would become a politician and that politician made a huge difference in um, not only Appomattox, Prince Edward County, Halifax, but in Virginia. So I cheer those 830 former Appomattox slaves. Well, let me show you something that while I was doing research, I, and this may be helpful for those who are interested in doing research, maybe you can see this, but I found out that at the Library of Virginia, they have the election results from October the 22nd, 1867. These results, the poll results are available at the Library of Virginia a treasure for anyone doing not only African-American um, research, but even uh, what was going on in the white community. And it even has the election results uh, by names for the 1869 um, election, uh, which was the second election that um, former slaves were able to vote in. And it has a listing of their names. So I wanna encourage you, if you're interested in that period, that's an excellent um, resource. Um, this is just a, a, probably just a small sampling of the research that uh, I've done on James W. D. Bland. And um, I was so impressed with what Bland did. Um, I approached the Board of Supervisors uh, in Appomattox um, to uh, advocate for his portrait to be hung in the courthouse. Um, there are no African-Americans in the courthouse. Um, all the officials there um, are, are white and the Board of Supervisors were kind enough to approve James W. Bland's portrait uh, being hung uh, in the courthouse uh, in Appomattox. I'm extremely excited about that. And my plan is to um, find as many of these 832 names and have them engraved in the frame going around James W.D. Bland and have a big day, have Hampton University come up and uh, they have a uh, just an awesome choir and I'm going to have a big day. Um, but we decided to wait because the pandemic hit us and uh, we're trying to wait until that kind of clears up and we're going to have a big dedication and um, we wanna honor also those 839 former Appomattox slaves that helped elect this, um, this awesome black man to represent Virginia. So if you have any questions for me, I would be glad to entertain you. All right, and thank you so much for that. Lots of lots of good information. And we did have a few questions come in as I'm battling my cat. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
So Niels wants to know, are there records on the members of the Appomattox clan and were they local Confederate veterans who had taken part in the surrender? Okay, we don't have any um, list of clan members per se. Um, I think it was in the, mm, I think Richmond Times Dispatch, I came across one man who was living in Alaska that was from Appomattox and the article mentioned that he had been part of the clan. Um, so, you know, we, you don't see any names given, but you do have accounts in the Freedmen's Bureau of um, people in disguise that attacked um, Black people in Appomattox. And I suspect that they were Klan's people. Um, and there are some names there. So if I, I guess I've come across maybe four or five names of possible um, Klan members. Um, but they, their identities, they were successful in uh, anonymity. Well, thank you for that answer. And uh, I would be curious to know, so of these 839 men, uh, how many of you, them have you been able to find information about and kind of flush them out as uh, individuals? I'm probably about uh, 35 to 40. Excellent. Yes, I've been able to use the census records. Um, for example, of course, everyone knows in Appomattox, Charles Duguid, um, you know, who was a blacksmith in the village. Um, you know, you have John Robertson, who was a shoeman um, in the village. So that was fascinating to have done research on maybe 30 or 40 people. And then I came across their names. That was extremely excited in the poll books where they show the vote, yes. And is there another story that stands out of an individual uh, that, that you found and, and researched? Yes, one that I guess I, I'll talk a little bit about is of course, Charles Duguid. Uh, Charles Duguid was um, believed to have been uh, freed um, from slavery, uh, emancipated um, from slavery. Um, well, let, let me back up because I'm, I'm, I'm getting confused because I'm so focused on Bland. <laughs> but anyway, let, let's go back to Duguid. Um, Duguid was believed to have been emancipated, but my research shows that he was born free. And, what, okay. and I've written it up and wish I had brought it with me. But anyway, I've been able to connect his freedom with one of the founding fathers of the United States of America, who um, influenced um, his mother's owner. Um, and I don't want to start calling names because it's been a while since I did the research, but um, that is absolutely amazing. But I want to talk a little bit about uh, McMahon. Mm -hmm. Charles W. McMahon. Mm -hmm. um, was phenomenal as far as overcoming um, the Klan. Um, his life was on the line. Um, he, um, he, he stayed here and he um, was kind of like the principal. It was like four different African-American schools um, here in Appomattox at one time. And he served as the principal of all those schools. Um, he, he is, I, mean, I, I have a lot of his writings because um, he worked for the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Freedmen Relief um, Association, um, which he would write letters back and forth. And um, he was such a champion for um, the Black community here in Appomattox. Um, that's a story that has to be told. Um, just a phenomenal um, young person, 23, 24 years old, you know, and one of the things as I looked at Charles W. McMahon, you know, I, I just wondered what would drive him to put his life on the line, uh, to leave um, Plymouth, Massachusetts, and come all the way to Appomattox, and his life is threatened constantly in his letters he talks about he talks about his love 
for the uh, poor freedmen and how poor they are. And, you know, use the word ignorant, of course, meaning not, you know, education and the things that they needed. Um, he was able to convince the Freedmen's Bureau to build a uh, school. You remember the school in the um, village was attacked and burned. They were going to repair it, but he persuaded them to build a new school. And the new school is where Galilee Baptist Church is located. Galilee Baptist Church was Plymouth Rock School. Plymouth Rock School was Galilee Baptist Church. And uh, McMahon was the force behind getting that school built, getting that church uh, built. Um, so uh, what any separation of church and state back then? I guess that really shows you what one person can do if they have the, the courage to stand up and yes, you know, definitely fight definitely. for the, the greater good. Yeah, so, and I, and I, I, and I think that's, that, that's extremely important. Um, I've compiled my research into an unpublished manuscript. I have not published it yet. Um, it's going to be called Black Gold um, in Appomattox. Um, and I've got probably 30 or 40 stories. Um, I'm, I apologize for just rambling on and on, but um, oh. I'm, I'm looking forward. I, you know, I'm thinking that one publisher looked at some samples and they were interested, but I just don't know whether I want to go that route now or whether I want to try to develop a podcast and tell the stories. I just really decided yet. Um, the publisher was concerned about whether there would be enough interest um, in, you know, our area, you know, with these stories to make it work, you know, profitable to them. So I don't know what I'm going to do with that, but I've got some great stories. It sounds like you really do. And getting back to uh, Bland, uh, Niels asked, did he earn praise? from former Confederates for his support of their reintegration into the political mainstream? I would say yes. I think he garnered their respect. Um, you know, you read articles in the Times Virginia, not excuse me, Times Virginia, Richmond Dispatch, um, you know, they were still throwing around the N word. Some people were, uh, but some people were giving him praise. Um, after the disaster, when they took his body to the depot to, um, to ship him back to Prince Edward County, they said that there was um, a line of white senators, black delegates, all at the depot, um, you know, to see his body off uh, from Richmond um, to return home to Prince Edward County. So, and also they appropriated $50 for the funeral. So uh, that, that says a lot that um, they appropriated that money to his widow to pay for his funeral. Yeah, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and somebody, uh, Peggy actually asked if you could talk a little bit about what the capital disaster was. And I think that's a really good question because not everybody's familiar uh, with uh, the capital disaster in 1870. Okay, they were having a hearing um, at the Capitol building because it was a big dispute about the sheriff's um, race, who was actually elected. So they were meeting to try to decide that, and they were on a upper floor, and the floor gave way. The weight um, of, of all the people that were there and everything came tumbling down. I think 60 people um, lost their life um, that day. Um, it, it was one of the worst disasters in the history of, um, of, of Virginia on uh, that day. Uh, and Bland was one of the ones that were crushed. And if you, if you Google uh, Capital Disaster Virginia, they even have the newspaper articles that you can read, anyone interested. And, and I mean, it talks about people crying for their mama, grand, grown men, you know, crying for their mothers. And they are very details about those people, the last things they said before they died. Uh, very interesting, very moving article. So I would encourage you just Google that and you can find uh, contemporary um, reports. 
um, that really describe what happened in great detail. All right, thank, thank you for that. And uh, on the topic of, of Bland still, James W. Bland, uh, are there any memorials to him? Um, very interesting. They are. They just did something a few years ago in Richmond. It's an emancipation monument, and Bland Bland has been included in that in Richmond. Um, I don't. I've never visited that before, but it's some kind of emancipation pro, emancipation project, um, and he is part of that. His name is included on that. You know, that's that's right. And this uh, Emancipation Monument was just unveiled in uh, September, at the end of September of this year. Okay. One of the projects that was in the making for a long time. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I encourage people uh, who are, are local and can get to this monument on Browns Island uh, to, to make a trip and visit it because it is so uh, powerful. You've got uh, an, an enslaved man or formerly enslaved man who's standing there uh, with his hands outstretched and it looks like the shackles are just falling away. And then you can see his back, you can see the, the scars on his back from whippings. And then there's a woman standing and she's got her newborn baby and she's lifting up the Emancipation Proclamation. And then at the base of the among, uh, uh, base of the monument, they highlight uh, African American uh, people who fought against slavery, and then those who fought for equal rights. So it is. Uh, it's. It was one of those projects that took, was in the making for a long time. But it is. Uh, it's an incredible monument, and it's Richmond's newest monument too, which is pretty exciting. So we know where Bland is buried in Prince Edward County, but I have not been able to find his grave. Um, I've searched, so I, I just maybe it's not a marker, maybe it was a marker and it, it is, is buried somewhere now, but I've not been able to find uh, his grave. That's a project I've been working on. And was Bland married? Did he have a, a wife or children, yeah. any family? He, he did get married. Um, he got married. Um, okay, he got elected in October of 1867. And later on that same year, he married. So he left a widow, no children, uh, when he died in, um, in 1870. And, and do we know what became of, of his widow? Uh, yes, she remarried. Um, and I think she stayed in Prince Edward County. Um, so I did a little digging and found her marriage record where she did get remarried. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And going back to Charles Duguid, uh, do you recall the founding father that may possibly have freed him? Wow. Ah, boy. No, and the founding father did not free him, but he educated uh, the slave master who owned uh, his, that owned Duguid's mother. And um, like I said, I don't want to call, try to call the name, I just do not, it just has left me, but it's just a fascinating story. First of all, it was believed that, that, um, that Duguid had been emancipated, but in the um, Southern Claims Commission records, um, he says he was not, he said he was born free. He said his mother was emancipated before he was born. So, um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, like I said, I don't want to call the name and get it wrong, but um, if anybody's interested, I, I would love to um, share with you the research because I've written it up, but I just cannot recall the name right now of which founding father um, it was. He was an instructor at William and Mary, um, and he believed in the emancipation of slaves, teaching them to read and gradual emancipation. The founding father did, and his students, um, um, some of them followed in his footsteps and educated their um, slaves and gradually emancipated them. So I apologize for not being more on top of that. Um, 
but uh, it's kind of like when you've done 40 or 50 um, stories, you know, the names start running together if you don't have your notes in front of you. I, yeah, I definitely understand the feeling there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a, a lot, of, a lot of facts and, and names to keep straight. Now, uh, Dugid, he uh, did he he had a family, if I recall. Oh yes. Did he? Yeah. Um, did he end up purchasing his wife as well? He purchased his wife. Her name was Sarah. Um, he purchased her. Um, it's very interesting. Um, when I wrote up the story. He is actually, you know, when you bought your family, you actually became a slave owner. You know, of course, they're motivated for different reasons. They want to make sure they can keep their families together. Um, but it, it's, you know, it, it, you know, when I thought about it, I said, you know, you can look at the tax records and see he is paying, you know, taxes on his children and his wife. And I, I, I'm sure a lot of that also has to do with the law in Virginia that. Yes. Is, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about? Um, yeah, they, they had a law in Virginia that if you emancipated your slaves, they had to leave Virginia. So um, if you wanted to keep your family intact, if you were free uh, black, uh, you had to buy them or or, you know, you they, you know, well, well, let me back up. Um, you know, well, it's two different things going on, of course. Uh, number one is you didn't want your family to be sold. That's why you would buy them. But if you were emancipated, you had to leave um, the state of Virginia, uh, which was very unfortunate. Um, some people were re-enslaved. They chose to be re-enslaved. Um, you know, there, there are stories in Campbell County. I don't know of any in Appomattox. Uh, of people um, because they could choose their master. They had been emancipated and they did not want to leave their families. They could choose who their master was going to be and stay in Virginia, petition the court to stay in Virginia and be re-enslaved. And I think it's a difficult thing for us to even kind of comprehend today what it would mean to have to leave uh, leave your home, your your family, the the environment that you're familiar with, and go yes. out to a new state and try to start a, a new life uh, mm -hmm. with with very little or almost nothing to build upon. Yeah, it's very interesting too. You find some white slave owners who would actually purchase property out of state for their slaves when they left, um, you know, Virginia. And yeah, I've come across stories like that in the court in court records where they are purchasing property. Oh, that's really interesting. I yes, um, I came across a story. Yeah. Came a story. Came across a story in Halifax. You know, doing research, and he is making appropriation for um, his slaves. And I think, matter of fact, I think um, Randall from Charlotte County who emancipated his slaves was, um, was an example of uh, purchasing property for his slaves and sending them to another state after emancipation. That, yeah, that's Research has been done on that. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't see any other questions coming in, but uh, would you like to tell us one more story about uh, anybody that you've researched that just really stood out? Um, one of the um, stories that I've come across um, is the doctors, people who were medical doctors who were uh, formerly enslaved people from Appomattox. Um, I've come across one, two, three, four uh, African-American doctors, which I found absolutely fascinating that these people went on and they received their medical degrees. As a matter of fact, two of those people were, one was a daughter of Charles Dugan and his granddaughter became medical doctors. Um, um, there's some great stories out there concerning his family. It's amazing that uh, even though they were not born in slavery, they were born right after slavery, 
but to have a daughter become a medical doctor and a granddaughter to become a medical doctor is very significant. Yeah, that is, uh, that really is. And where were they, do you know anything about how they got their, their education? Uh, yes, they uh, received their medical uh, degrees from Michigan. Uh, matter of fact, they studied under um, Kellogg, uh, Dr. Kellogg, um, the one who brought us Kellogg cereals. Um, he was a medical doctor um, during that period and um, had a medical school um, in um, Battle Creek, Michigan. So that's where Charles Dugas, uh, too, um, his daughter, granddaughter, uh, studied uh, under Kellogg. That, that is uh, fascinating as well. I love the way you find these little tidbits in history that connect to oh, yeah, you know, things amazing. that we still know today or you know, names oh, yeah. that we're familiar with. It's amazing. And I did have one more question uh, come in. And uh, Jane, by the way, says, great presentation. I would buy your book. Oh, uh, so <laughs> sweet. Thank you. Uh, and she wants to know, did McMahon serve in the Union forces during the Civil War? Uh, very interesting. I've not been able to verify that. But there is a Charles W. McMahon from um, Massachusetts who is in the Union uh, Army, but I have not been able to tie it to being him, you know, and sometimes, you know, you, um, you, you know, you, you can't verify whether it's the person. I, I have not been able to find anything to verify other than there is a Charles W. McMahon who's in the Union Army. He's from Massachusetts, but I have not been able to make that definitive identification. Yeah, and that's to me is one of the, the things about history that makes it frustrating, but also <laughs> yes. fascinating. Yes. Because when you do finally find that piece of information or that link, it's just so exciting. Yeah, so it is. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, hopefully you'll be able to, to find that. Yeah, I'm going to keep looking. <laughs> Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. It's been excellent uh, having you with us and uh, hearing these stories that uh, are not often brought to light. And I wanna say thank you to everybody who has uh, logged in and, and viewed tonight. I think there may have been some issues with the link earlier. So uh, I'm glad that the kind of last minute email I sent out seems to, uh, seems to have worked. Uh, so thank you for joining us. And uh, as always, we really support, appreciate uh, the support of our viewers and also our members. And if you like the, the programming that you do, if you like uh, what the American Civil War Museum is and uh, how we are uncovering these stories or uh, at least opening up a platform to where these stories can be talked about, uh, think about becoming a member. And if you're interested in the American Civil War Museum and our programs and in membership, uh, you can go to our website at acwm.org. Well, thank you again, uh, Al Jones. It's been great uh, having you with us. And thank you. Good night, everyone, and see Bye. you for the thank next you all. happy hour. Bye-bye.